We are so glad that you could join us. Uh, we hope that you have um, enjoyed the, the film. Uh, we have, we are very, very fortunate to have among us, uh, not just uh, uh, the person responsible for the creation of the film and uh, documenting uh, the landless movement, but also we have Diana Cristina Machado, uh, who is an agronomist and uh, actually is a doctoral candidate in rural development at the Federal University in Rio Grande do Sul. Um, she has been working on issues of poverty, uh, on poverty as epistemologies of the South. Um, and she was part of the Via Campesina Brazil Commission on the Environment. Um, along with Diana, we also have Jose Luis Rodriguez, who also has been a member of the Landless Worker Movement, uh, actually since 1995. And uh, he has actually been in uh, working with a uh, similar movement in Paraguay, Venezuela, and Haiti. Um, and we have Dr. Kathleen Schoering from the University of Pittsburgh, who is uh, the water equity postdoctoral associate with the Pittsburgh Collaboratory on uh, Water Research, Education, and Outreach at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she has worked with la uh, landless uh, movements in Brazil as well. Uh, they will be our panelists in addition to Andreas Hernandez, whom I would like uh, to have us uh, introduce uh, the, the different panelists as well. So Dr. Andreas Hernandez, um, if you would take the word. Well, thank you so much for this invitation to uh, screen the film. It's a uh, it's a huge pleasure, and uh, I'm really delighted that UNM and the University of Pittsburgh are, are doing this collaboration to bring folks together. So thank you so much. And, you know, as I'm sure everybody here knows that screening a film and having a conversation about it takes a lot of people, and uh, it's surprisingly difficult. So, uh, you know, I really want to thank, uh, on the UNM side, Francis Hayashida and um, um, Eleni Valeria and Marlene Linares uh, Gonzalez, who've been doing so much work on the UNM side. And I'm just now meeting uh, Manuel and Alexis from the Pitt side. And it's a pleasure. And thank you so much for your, for your part in this organization. And uh, before jumping in, I also want to thank the families of Copava for the opportunity to live and film over many months and share some of their experiences. And I'm, I'm so happy that we have uh, Diana and Jose Luis with us, that I think they're able to, as you can tell from the film, this is a historical kind of uh, has got to. And uh, Diana and Jose Luis are very much on the front about where things are going. And they live in the Filos do Sepe settlement in Viamão, Brazil. And uh, I have the great fortune that I've been living in an eco-village uh, not too far, so we've had a chance to uh, become compañeros and uh, amigos. And uh, I've, I've had a chance to learn about what they're doing on their settlement, that they've become the largest producers of, of organic rice in Latin America, as one example. And so I think what they're gonna be able to share with us is kind of the next scale, that how did this one settlement in the south of Brazil really helped uh, um, shoot off so many other things happening. And I don't wanna say that Copaba was the only one responsible. There are different settlements around Brazil in the 90s who were doing experiments, but Copaba was certainly one of the best known and so, some of the most expressive. But since then, you know, other, other initiatives have taken off on such other scales and entering uh, um, public policy. And what does it take for agroecology to get beyond the individual farmer. I'm seeing that uh, in some of the history, of some of the uh, um, chats coming up that people are wondering, you know, what could this mean for the US? And I think there's so much we can learn from the Brazilian case about not only maybe the experience of Copava and cooperation on one you know, extensive territory, but what it starts to mean to work with governance and public policy and make this happen at a whole nother scale. So it would be my great pleasure to speak a bit more about the film and 
you know, there's some things I would love to share, but uh, I think much more interesting would be hearing a bit from each of our panelists that uh, I've asked uh, both uh, Jose Luis and Diana to maybe share about five, seven minutes of you know, kind of uh, expanding from the film. And then uh, Caitlin has uh, so graciously appeared also to share some of her extensive work with movements in Brazil. And uh, I believe the idea is that they'll kind of warm up the conversation for us. And then uh, Manuel will uh, facilitate a kind of question answer conversation. Então, uh, uh, Diana, um, eu vou pedir que você comence e uh, ah, mais ou menos cinco ou sete minutos uh, expandindo um pouco no, no uh, filme, eu, eu vou traduzir. E se você pode ficar com uh, pedaços um pouco curtos, vou uh, agradecer. E depois uh, vou convidar, uh, convidar, convidar José Luis e depois uh, Caitlin. And uh, I'm going to apologize to everybody out there that our translator disappeared into the, uh, into the uh, atmosphere somewhere. And I, I've got a horrible short-term memory, so I'm not a great translator, but I'm going to do my best. And Caitlin has offered to fill in any gaps. So thank you, Caitlin. Então, uh, Diana, por favor, uh, começa por nós. Ah, boa noite, boa tarde a todos. É, primeiramente, eu gostaria de agradecer ao convite do Instituto Ibérico e Latino-Americano da Universidade do Novo México, né? E do nosso amigo Andreas. E, e parabenizar também a, a realização dessa atividade de hoje e parabenizar também a realização do filme, né? Que foi um trabalho maravilhoso. So uh, she thanks so much for the invitation today, both from UNM and from Pitt. And uh, she also thanked me for this invitation, which I thanked 10 times back. And uh, she also wanted to congratulate and offer her congratulations for this event and uh, also very kindly about the film. So I would like to talk a luta como um modo de vida. Acho que o que eu tenho aprendido com, com o NFT, com as pessoas que eu conheci, que eu tenho contato, é dessa, dessa luta com uma pedagogia, como um modo de viver, como uma filosofia de vida. So she wants to begin with this concept of struggle as a way of life. And that this is something that she's learned very deeply as a member of the MST, that it's a, it's a way of life, it's a pedagogy, and it's a philosophy. Então, estar sempre em movimento, não, não parar nunca, né? Estar sempre em movimento, seja na luta pela reforma agrária, na luta pela terra, na luta pela agroecologia, na luta contra o patriarcado, pelo feminismo comunitário é, é um modo de, de ocupar o mundo e estar no mundo. And uh, so the struggles that they never they never stop, whether it's land reform, um, oops, I can't read my handwriting, a, a work, um, patriarchy, uh, for feminism, and um, it's a way of occupying. It's a way of being. Uh, e essa, essas lutas, elas são, são batalhas, como nós vimos no, no filme, né? mais duras, mas elas são lutas cotidianas também. Então, produzir o nosso próprio alimento, não depender é, exclusivamente dos mercados, da indústria, produzir o nosso chá, não depender do, exclusivamente dos, dos hospitais, dos médicos, produzir saúde, isso é a luta concreta e cotidiana contra o capitalismo, contra o patriarcado. So, uh, she points out that there are many kinds of struggle, that some of what the film shows are some of the more uh, difficult, um, duro struggles, but she really wants to bring attention to the struggles of everyday life, that, uh, you know, what it means to produce food and not depend on markets or, or big ag, that to be able to produce teas and not be completely dependent on allopathic medicine and the medical system, to be able to produce uh, health. And um, so this, uh, 
this concrete struggle of the everyday is the real struggle against capitalism and patriarchy. Então, a reforma agrária é hoje, continua sendo uma luta atual, mas ela não é mais apenas uma luta para resolver o problema de um, de um agricultor ou agricultora sem terra. Ela é, para nós, do MST, uma luta de uma reforma agrária popular. Ela é uma reforma agrária para todos, ela é necessária para todos. E o foco central hoje, para a gente, é na produção de alimentos saudáveis. So, um, agrarian reform today isn't so much about reform for a farmer or a community, but it's really about agrarian, a popular, a widespread agrarian reform for everybody. And uh, one where healthy food is at the center. Então, quando a gente sente no próprio corpo, quando a gente sente a vontade, o desejo, que aquilo que a gente come e produz na nossa própria casa, no nosso quintal, que é saboroso, que é doce, que é crocante, que é fresco, quando a gente sente, quando a gente deseja que isso não seja só nosso, mas que todos possam ter acesso a esse alimento, eu acho que é aí quando a agroecologia ela se torna algo... É, para além de, da obrigação ou algo para além da nossa consciência, uma luta necessária. So, when, uh, when we feel in our bodies that the food that we're growing is flavorful, it's crunchy, and, and, and it's fresh, that, that there's the desire that everybody should have access to this. And so this is when... Um, Agroecology becomes more than a necessity. It kind of starts to go to a different, a different level of consciousness. Então, eu acredito que esse movimento da agroecologia, da agroecologia, ele é cada vez mais crescente e irreversível. Já é um movimento incontornável, seja para nós do MST, seja para a sociedade de uma maneira geral, porque nós estamos falando, quando isso parte de um desejo, de uma vontade, eu acho que nós estamos falando de uma conexão, a conexão entre todos nós, seres humanos, uma conexão entre nós e os não humanos, inclusive, de nós nesse tempo e nesse espaço. So, agroecology, in this moment, is, is growing and is irreversible. And this is true both within the MST and uh, wider society. And when agroecology uh, agro is linked to desire, it becomes a thing of connection, connection between humans, between humans and, and the non-human world. E para finalizar, então, viver, sentir, falar de agroecologia nos obriga, então, a enfrentar desigualdades estruturais, seja o racismo, o patriarcado, as desigualdades sociais do capitalismo, porque como é que vai haver essa conexão entre humanos se alguns seres humanos não são vistos como humanos, se são mortos pela sua cor da pele ou se são mortos por, pelo seu gênero, né? que é o que nós vivemos enquanto sociedade aqui no Brasil e nos Estados Unidos, eu acredito que também existam essas desigualdade. Então, acho que esse é o nosso desafio da agroecologia. So, she's going to end with the sense that when uh, we, we want to and we feel when we talk about um, agroecology, we're really confronting um, uh, inequal uh, structural inequality. And, oh my goodness, I lost my handwriting again. Oh, um, and structural inequality on many, many levels, whether it's race, um, patriarchy, um, that uh, it's really looking at society um, and inequality of capitalism. And so the connections uh, be, uh, within humans, um, oh, that, that agroecology is making these connections with humans and uh, across gender, across race, And uh, she sees that as really the, the challenge today, uh, both in Brazil and she imagines also in the US. And so for 
for Diana, agroecology, the real challenge is uh, inequality. Bem, muito obrigado, Diana. And she, she says, thank you, which she said in English, so sorry. And uh, so thank you so much. And um, I, I would now like to invite José Luis to uh, share a few words. Gostaria muito convidar José Luis para compartilhar algumas palavras também. Tudo bem, Andréas, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado pelo Manuel, que é um moderador especial. Muitas graças, professor. E felicitar o Andrés por esse ponto. A gente estava vendo o documentário mais atentamente, assim, né? E ele é muito autêntico, muito original. So, uh, um, José Luis uh, thanks uh, everybody and gives a special thanks to Manuel, our facilitator, and is very kind in his words about the film, that he says he's had a chance to look a little closer and says the film is very authentic, it's very original. Outra característica importante é que o documentário é, traz muita uh, seriedade e convicção né, dos entrevistados. Os entrevistados falam com bastante é, vontade, com bastante é, autenticidade a palavra. Né? And uh, one thing that uh, he enjoyed about the film, and again, I think very kind, uh, he says that the seriousness and the conviction in which the interviewees were speaking, um, that, that he see, sees them as speaking very authentically about their, about their lives. Então, o documentário é uma referência. É uma referência para o assunto que eu vou tratar aqui, muito brevemente, que é a ideia de transformação social na concepção um pouco do, do MST. So, uh, then the film is a reference for what he'd like to share today. Um, which is social transformation from the perspective of the MST. Então, a transformação social é um dos é um dos objetivos que fundamentam a existência do movimento sem terra desde eh, o final dos anos 80. É uma base determinante na existência do MST. So, since the late 80s, the transformation, uh, social transformation has really been at the base of the reason and existence of the MST. E a cada um período histórico, a cada mudança de conjuntura, esse objetivo macro ganha características particulares. E... Uh, desculpa. Um, so that at every, um, at every big change, at every major change of the, of the conjuncture, that um, that uh, this kind of macro question has remained and continues to uh, grow and take on very, very particular aspects. Em algum momento, por exemplo, a gente acreditava que a conquista da terra seria, vamos dizer assim, suficiente para completar essa ideia de transformação social, que apenas a conquista da terra não levaria a uma grande transformação. No entanto, fomos percebendo que Não é somente a conquista da terra que leva, então, a uma transformação social mais ampla. So, in the beginning, the movement really believed that uh, uh, the, the, the gaining of land, the, 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 the conquering of land, the occupation of land, would be sufficient for social transformation. But then it became more clear that, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, one, it's one aspect, but there's much more. Fomos percebendo, então, por exemplo, que é necessário uma mudança no modelo econômico, no modelo econômico para a agricultura. Como parte dessa transformação social, então é necessário mudar a, o modelo econômico da atividade agrícola, né? na atividade agrícola. E então, o que se tornou aparente é que não é apenas uma agrária reforma, mas é realmente necessário transformar ou mudar o modelo econômico, e, em particular, o modelo agrário econômico. E é necessário, então, lutar para que, o, para que o Estado, para que o Estado Nacional se transforme e consiga efetivar essas mudanças. Quer dizer, a luta do MST é uma luta 
para conquistar, é, para fazer com que o Estado né, é, desenvolva uma política realmente é, transformadora. And so uh, here's with the question of the state, that uh, the state needs to become capable of making happen social uh, social transformation, and that the, the that's the state's role to develop public policy in order to do this. E é exatamente nesta neste momento que entra a agroecologia, né, e a luta em defesa do meio ambiente como uma luta determinante na atual conjuntura do uh, da nossa sociedade. And so here's where agroecology enters um, and, uh, and uh, ecological health, ecological protection enters as a really determining struggle in today's conjuncture. E, então, nos últimos, últimos anos, o MST vem fazendo muitos esforços no nível nacional e internacional é, justamente para desenvolver a agroecologia, a produção de alimentos saudáveis como, como a, a sua principal bandeira de luta. Né? And so for this, the MST has been working for many years now, uh, nationally and internationally, so that agroecology can really become the, uh, the flag, the main... Um, Oh, I can't think of a, a good translation in English, but the, the bandeira, the, the main struggle um, for, for social transformation. E é por essa razão que inúmeras iniciativas eh, são desenvolvidas né, no nosso país. O, o Brasil é um país gigantesco, mas são muitas as experiências, são muitas as uh, cooperativas, famílias que se envolvem nessa atividade, já que ela é uma digamos assim, um princípio do MST nesse momento. And so, for this reason that uh, there are innumerable things happening across Brazil, and Brazil is a, a giant country, but that there are cooperatives and families that are all kind of focused around the central orienting politics or concept of agroecology. Um, por último, é dizer que essas, a luta para transformar uh, um modelo econômico, para transformar um, um modelo agrícola, ele está ganhando muito espaço dentro do MST, mas é necessário que ele, que ele seja algo, como a Dayana se referiu anteriormente, algo que as pessoas agarrem, gostem, queiram fazer. Né? Isso é uma coisa muito importante, tem, tem, tem uma, um aspecto subjetivo nele, né, Andreas? Tem um aspecto subjetivo nessa luta, que é necessário para que essa luta, essa luta política tenha, digamos assim, é, ressonância. And so lastly, that uh, whereas the you know, economic transformation, agricultural transformation are absolutely necessary, that uh, there, it's so necessary to have this space within the MST that people enjoy, that people hold on to, that people hug, um, you know, the, the struggle, that it's something enjoyable. And so he really he even says it to, twice, that this, uh, this aspect of subjectivity is, is as central to the struggle of the MST as these kind of larger political goals. É isso. Muito obrigado aí pela oportunidade e seguimos sempre à disposição. And so thank you so much for this opportunity and... Uh, Yeah, he's always at the dis uh, disposition to, uh, to speak. E muito obrigado, José Luis. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, so now I'd like to pass the word to uh, Caitlin, who I think uh, can offer us uh, another perspective. Thank you. And I will speak in English. Do you want to just, tran do you want to, Live translation, or are you going to just type into the chat? I'm going to I'm going to type some things into the chat for them. Okay. Eu vou digitar para Diana, José, Luis, eu vou digitar algumas coisas para vocês. Um, so it's a it's a great honor to be here today with everyone, and I wanted to just give a little bit of background of my of my own history, um, and then kind of weave that into I think some of the themes we're talking about, and I will try to do that both slowly and quickly. <laughs> um, so in 
2008, uh, when I was 20 years old, I was participating in an exchange program in Brazil. And as part of this very unique program that no longer exists, um, I had I I learned about the MST, and um, I visited actually um, the film talks about some of the violence that the MST has faced by the state, and one of those events occurred uh, in 1996 at El Dorado do Carajas, where 19 people were murdered um, by by military police. And so I went, I was brought to this site where that happened and learned about that history. And then afterwards, uh, we visited a, an MST encampment, kind of what the film briefly shows were with tents, you know, the early stages. Um, and then finally spent several days living with a family at a, an MST settlement, um, not the one talked about, not in the film, but um, Palmares Dois, uh, which is in the south of the Pará state in Brazil. And those experiences taught me many things, um, but one of the things they taught me is about the, the violence that our current economic model of capitalism um, perpetrates against many people in the world. But it also taught me about the power of people coming together to envision a different world and working together to create that. And so um, there, there's other themes that I definitely you know, could touch on related to that, but I wanna make sure we have time today to really have questions and also hear from um, other panelists. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but I think the one thing I'll say is the film mentioned at the end that agroecology does three things, right? It preserves nature, it doesn't exploit workers, and it doesn't exploit consumers. And I think um, to me that speaks to kind of the interconnectivity of both justice and injustice um, that I've, I've learned from both um, MST and then also fast forward a decade in 2018 and I was back in Brazil now doing work for my, my PhD um, on water and right to water movements and specifically working with a, a movement, um, Movimento dos Atangiros por Bajajans, or movement of people affected by dams, which is also a movement that's a part of um, La Via Campesina, which was mentioned in the film, right? And works with the MST um, and kind of comes, it's a popular social movement. And what, you know, the, the theme, Another very like key theme for my own um, my own learning and understanding has been and this this point that already um, both Diana and Jose mentioned about the interconnectivity right it's a fight yes it's a fight for land reform or it's a fight against people being displaced from dams in the case of Mobi but it's also a fight against the economic model. It's a fight against patriarchy and it's a fight for envisioning the sort of world we want to create. And I think in the United States and even in my own discipline of sociology and study of transnational social movements, there's often this idea that ideas go from the so-called global North or the US or Europe and flow to the rest of the world, which is a very actually like imperialist, colonialist idea. And what I would argue, right, is there is so much that we in the US can learn from the MST, can learn from Mobi. And one of those things, right, is this idea of, of how we create the world we want to live in and how we do that and, and how people are actually doing that. Um, and so like one concrete example, it's noted at the end of the film is this idea of food sovereignty, right? that came from the MST, you know, um, and, and I think that um, it's also that connection of connecting theory and praxis also, which oftentimes I think, uh, especially in academic circles, we're not, is, is trickier for us to do. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and uh, thank you. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, uh, obrigado, Jose, Diana. Uh, thank you, Andreas. I, um, there are a couple of questions that uh, showed up in our Q and A, and you may have seen. And actually, uh, Dr. Hernandez made made um, mention of of one, in in which connects, I think, to what you were just saying, Caitlin, in terms of the U.S. 
right? Um, the question was, you know, what, you know, what are the conversations in the US that would help us move this industrial agriculture model uh, and transition to the, a sustainable model? Uh, Jose and Diana, I, I'm gonna translate, uh, I'm gonna interpret a little bit for them. Um, la, la primera pregunta es acerca de eh, cómo en, en, la, en, la, en esta conversación se puede incluir a los Estados Unidos eh, al tratar de hacer esta transición a un modelo eh, agroecológico sostenible. Y, y la pregunta se la hago a Caitlin porque ella acaba de, de tocar el punto de los Estados Unidos. ¿no? So, Caitlin. Um, what, uh, what would you respond to, to that, to that question? Struggling with my mute button. Um, well, I think, you know, I would, I'd love to, to also hear what um, Jose and Diana have to say to this question, but I think my immediate response would be one, you know, um, so there, there is a, um, and I think this is mentioned in the film, there is actually, there is a movement in the United States that's a part of this larger La Via Campesina, right? And there are these, what we, whatever we want to call them, international, transnational, translocal, but connections happening. And there are where people, where you know, farmers in Brazil are connecting with farmers from the US um, and from all around the world and having conversations about how we how this can be done. And I think the really powerful thing also about thinking about agroecology is transitioning to that, that in each locality, it might look a little different, right? Because each place is different. But I think, you know, from, from my perspective, for many of us probably here in this panel and in this space, that a huge challenge in the US is is doing this really hard work of having hard conversations with our family and our friends and also organizing to push against corporate power that is saying this model of agriculture that we currently have, that's really terrible for workers, it's terrible for the environment, it's terrible for animals, it's terrible for everyone, but that it's kind of forced on us as if it's the only option. And so I think this goes back, like if we want to think about how we create agroecology, how we create a, to use the term, right, sustainable model of agriculture in the US, part of that struggle then is we have to contend with the fact that this economic model of capitalism that many of us, most of us have been taught is the only way is not compatible with life. <laughs> and so I, I think that that's, that is an obstacle and a challenge that, that we have to kind of confront. Jose, Jose Luis and Diana, eh, no sé si, si eh, qué tanto captaron de lo que dijo Caitlin, pero ella se refería a cómo el sistema en el que vivimos en Estados Unidos parece ser, o sea, por la manera en la que crecemos y vivimos, parece ser la única alternativa, ¿no? Y cómo, eh, la, la pregunta, pues la, la, la interrogante que surge de, de, de Seira, Seira Namaste, eh, era cuál es la conversación que tenemos que tener aquí en los Estados Unidos para hacer una transición como la que ustedes han logrado. Y, y no sé eh, cómo, cómo lo ven ustedes desde su punto de vista. Yo pienso que una cuestión interesante sería buscar oír los agricultores, pequeños agricultores de ahí. Se, se, se resta, deve restar poucos, né? Mas o que os indígenas, as comunidades tradicionais, os pequenos agricultores, esses que estão resistindo de algum modo, né? Que não veem na, na modernidade, na, nas luzes, né? Nessa, todo esse modo conquistador de, de fazer a agricultura, de fazer a vida mas que estão resistindo, o que, que eles estão querendo, o que, que eles podem dizer? Né? Acho que essa poderia ser uma questão interessante, porque a agroecologia ela é muito desse resgate, desse resgate do, do ancestral, do tradicional, não, não uma volta ao passado, não se trata de voltar ao passado, 
mas se trata de reconhecer os processos de resistência, né? de, de reconhecer com lugar de fala, com, com essa potência que, que tem, né? não como um resquício do passado. Eu acho que esse movimento o MST é, vem tentando fazer aqui no Brasil. Essa é uma questão. Não sei se quer tradução, fazer a tradução. Por favor. Eu esqueci algo, mas acredito que, que, que compreendi. É, so she she says that the key here is is to focus or or think about uh, and perhaps connect or leverage what small uh, 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 farmers, what, what small producers, what uh, traditional producers are working on uh, to move forward with, uh, with the potential uh, for, for change here. Because we are in the US facing this enormity uh, uh, of a situation in a system uh, And the second part, I, I'm actually, uh, Andreas, perhaps you can, you can help me because I, I wasn't good enough to take notes. So the second part, I'm slipping on. I can also, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, please, Caitlin. Well, I, I would just, there was also the point about, you know, it's about learning from the past, not returning to the past, but also learning from the past and kind of creating what it, the new, our new future together. And maybe I just add that uh, I think at the very end that she says this has been a real important basis of, of the MST. And, and Manuel, you, you, you are facilitating. You shouldn't need to translate as well. I'm happy to take over the translation. It's, it's too much. I'm trying to go back and forth, but um, great. Um, it, you know, it, it also, brings to mind and maybe just projecting a little bit of my own sort of worries, anxieties and, and preoccupations about uh, these, these matters, how, I mean, the hostility, the physical, the, the threat of physical uh, violence, right, and harm uh, that perhaps is more accepted or let's not say more accepted, but that is, that more commonly occurs in Latin America uh, in such overt ways that doesn't occur as overtly here. It, Jose and Diana, acabo de hablar de que una de las cosas que me conecta uh, con este de mis preocupaciones es qué tan común es la violencia física y la intimidación violenta en nuestros países en Latinoamérica versus la manera menos abierta en que se, eso ocurre aquí en los Estados Unidos, ¿no? Um, so, tal, tal vez lo que quisiera es si ustedes, habiendo, o sea, estando en medio de esa lucha, eh, ¿cómo, es que es, ¿cómo es que se enfrenta? O sea, ¿cuál es ese contraste que ustedes ven? Si hay contraste, si ustedes ven ese contraste en en lograr la meta, ¿no? En lograr llegar a ese punto. Manuel, uh, did you mind if I kind of wrap that back to something in the film? Please do. That's, uh, so I, I really appreciate what everyone's saying. Uh, agradezco mucho uh, todo lo que el profesor está hablando. Um, But I, I want to speak about one experience in the film, but maybe just with a, a quick, uh, um, just something quick that uh, clearly the U.S. is full of amazing, brilliant, regenerative farmers that, uh, you know, I don't think the U.S. lacks fantastic farmers. Obviously, the constellation of power and who these farmers are, I think, looks a little different than in the U.S. But um, kind of building on what Diana said, that... Uh, Maybe one thing that hasn't, at least to my knowledge, happened to the scale that we can see some of the work that uh, Jose and uh, Diana are involved with is really that scaling up, the building of cooperatives that have a scale that they're able to not only confront, but even enter markets. And again, going to uh, uh, 
the settlement where, where they live, they're the organic race in Latin America, bringing together through a cooperative structure, hundreds of fields. And then I think that, uh, and, and I, I hope I'm not misspeaking here, I'm sure there are many people a lot more about agroecology in the US than I do, but uh, something that I've not seen so strongly in the US is really um, communities of practice who are wanting to, able to, have the space to, I'm not sure which, to engage public policy on the sorts of levels that we can see some of the really successful scaling up in other parts of the world, and particularly Brazil. And so Jose Luis really brought out that important relationship with the state and the state, the democratic state, as the agent for developing public policy. And that's something that uh, obviously there's amazing things happening in cities across the US, but I've not seen that at the same scale. But um, I wanted to bring it um, to something Manuel was saying about the violence. And there's so many different ways this violence might be understood. That um, in the film, when we were filming about the transition to agroecological dairy, that women wouldn't say this on camera, but several women sought me out off camera to tell me how much familial relations had changed when the relationships between men and the dairy cows changed. That uh, they said in different ways that the, uh, the you know, fathers were better, um, better fathers to their children. They had a different quality of relation, a much more intimate relationship with their children. And that domestic violence had radically dropped in the settlements. And since they spoke with me about this off camera, it's not something I felt uh, appropriate to include in the film, but I do feel appropriate to talk with people because they spoke with me about this very openly. But it does bring out, I mean, the eco-feminists have been saying this for decades, that how much of our agricultural systems violence against animals is reflected in our own violent social institutions. And so that violence might uh, be very deep and very subtle. And so the ways that Diana and Jose Luis and Caitlin are talking about how agroecology um, confronts these violences, I, you know, in the way that Jose Luis was saying, even at that level of subjectivity, that I, I would suggest it goes very deep. I want to say to you in chat. I was, so you don't have to. Oh, thank you. Oh, we're both writing. <laughs> Okay. Um, Eu gostaria de falar mais uma coisinha da pergunta anterior, depois. Só é, me parece que um, um processo interessante são a, os intercâmbios. Nós, do MST, só logramos, só alcançamos muitas das nossas conquistas porque a gente ouviu muitos outros povos, muitos outros movimentos. E por isso as brigadas internacionalistas. Então, quando a Caitlin diz que os, os Estados Unidos, vocês, as pessoas, não talvez todos, né, é, podem aprender muito com o MST, isso é... Eu entendi isso, né? não sei se entendi certo, mas me parece algo fantástico assim, de se ouvir, né? porque assim nós aprendemos muito com, com outros movimentos e com vocês também. E, então, me parece que pensar... Eu adoraria conhecer agricultores, pequenos agricultores nos Estados Unidos e contar um pouco da nossa experiência. Né? Imagino que muitas outras pessoas do Brasil, do MST, também adorariam fazer isso. Né? Então, quem sabe, pensar numa troca de experiência é, entre agricultores do MST e agricultoras mulheres né? e, e pessoas do, dos Estados Unidos. Né, como, não como uma solução de, algum, de alguma coisa, mas como possibilidades, como troca mesmo, como intercâmbio. I'll take a stab at that, unless... Manuel, you, you look like you were about to jump in there. No, I was going to ask if you would. <laughs> But... Okay. So I'm happy to. So um, it's, uh, Dan is talking a little bit about um, the process of exchange and, um, and that the MST has been able to perhaps do so much 
because of these exchanges and exchanging with people you know all around brazil and all around the world and uh, so she really sees that exchange not not in this instrumental way like okay we're going to get together and solve all the problems but just this ongoing exchange is kind of the basis for so much of what the movement is doing and so she said you know she, she loves to hear that maybe the us could learn so much from brazil and that she'd be thrilled you know for example the possibility to speak with small, small farmers around the us and have this exchange and uh, but but again not, not about okay we're going to come up with the solution now but just that uh, you know they're just looking at different possibilities and I'll add that uh, if things go well, we're going to be very fortunate that Diana and Jose Luis might be able to spend a year with us um, through LAII here in uh, Albuquerque. So everyone's welcome to come visit. That's a great offer. Um, I, I think Jose Luis has, <laughs> has something to say. I quero gostaria de dizer algo ainda nessa nesse assunto, porque o assunto da sustentabilidade não, não é um assunto muito fácil de ser efetivado. É, André, eu acredito que, para complementar, a universidade tem um papel importante nesse aspecto. Por quê? Porque ela pode ajudar a organizar o pensamento, né? estudar e convocar a sociedade organizada preferencialmente, para discussões acerca do que ela que ela considera importante naquele momento. Então, se a sustentabilidade, meio ambiente ou alimentação saudável é um assunto pertinente, a universidade pode, sim, é, criar mecanismos de convocação da sociedade né, para é, resgatar conhecimento e para compartilhar conhecimento com essa comunidade, né? E eu acho que isso então é uma coisa importante e inclusive para influenciar no Estado para produzir políticas públicas é, de acordo com aquilo que foi é, é, debatido, discutido. Então a universidade pode ser uma promotora de um grande movimento, inclusive. Yeah. Muito lindo, e vamos fazer, vamos ver. That, uh, did I just cut somebody off? I'm sorry. So, um, José Luis is bringing out how the university has such an important role in all of this, because the university can really support organizing, studying, and then bringing together or inviting organized society together for these discussions, for these exchanges and uh, can take you know, what's important in society today, uh, environment, sustainability, healthy food, and that um, the university can create mechanisms to really bring people together, to invite the, the larger conversation. And this is through rescuing um, knowledge, through sharing knowledge, and uh, maybe even uh, you know, quite interestingly, starting to influence public policy. And so Jose Luis is suggesting that the university has this very important role as a promoter of all these questions. Can, is, can I add something to all of that or, um, or do, are we out of time? For, okay. Please do, Kane. Yeah, so just something that both um, Diana and Jose said. So I think, you know, when we um, think about the importance of like, of, of internationalism, right? I think that that's something that we often, we struggle with in the US. And one of the like really frankly beautiful things I've learned from um, Mabi and other social movements in Brazil is this idea that we can learn from each other and that we have a lot to learn from each other. And that actually, it's not just like a good thing to do it. We have to do it. We have to have these, make these connections, right? Um, and I think like that, that then, leads right into what Jose was saying about the role that universities can play. And I think there's not, you know, it's a, it's a complicated question, but I would argue that it kind of goes back to this idea of is education going to be a space of liberation 
like what Paulo Freire, the, the Brazilian educator talks about, is education going to be liberatory or is education and the university going to be a place that maintains the status quo? And I think often the university is a place that maintains the status quo. And so I kind of say that knowing you know, that a lot of the audience here today is probably uh, from the US as kind of a challenge. How are we going to fight that and subvert that? And, and the final thing I just wanted to mention is, and I, I recognize I also say this as someone um, born in the United States who is from the United States who has never um, lived for a very long period of time in, in Latin America. But I would argue that the US state also is very violent. And when we think about uh, even agriculture and farm workers, most of the farm workers here, right, are they're immigrants. Many of them are undocumented immigrants. And there's great violence perpetrated against them constantly. Or we can think about even police violence at, at protests, right, um, and killing, especially Black people, Black men. Um, and also the violence that we have more people in prison than any country in the world. I think our violence is more invisible. And so that makes it trickier to organize a mass, kind of get everyone to come together to fight against it. I think a lot of our violence is more invisible, but I would argue that it's very much there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make that, that challenge. Um. Caitlin, and I think that's a point, point well taken and, and very true. Uh, it, it's not that the violence doesn't happen. It's how, how different it is, how it's uh, surreptitious for a lot of us who are privileged enough to not have to experience it in our every hour and every day, um, which is you know, completely true. I wanted to come back to one question that Lisa North uh, put uh, for, and I think for Jose Luis and, and, and Diana and perhaps for Andreas as well, where in the film, it talks about uh, 17 uh, member families in the cooperative today, but then it started with 50 families. So Lisa North is asking, so what happened? Uh, just, just in Luis, uh, or uh, Diana, Diana uh, el falo con José Luis porque el fala uh, español. <laughs> Maes, uh, la pregunta es, eh, en, el, en el documental salen eh, 50 familias fundadoras, pero que hoy en día son 17 las que viven en, 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 en la cooperativa. Entonces, ¿qué pasó con el resto? La pregunta. Um, nos anos 90, o, o MST estimulou muito a, a cooperação agrícola e a formação de cooperativas. Né? Existiram é, inúmeras cooperativas é, aqui no estado do Rio Grande do Sul e no Brasil também. É, antes vai, vai traduzir, né? Desculpa. <risos> So, uh, anotando. Um, so uh, starting in the 90s, the MST really took on this role of, of organizing cooperatives and uh, um, cooperatives in, in all parts of Brazil. Algumas dessas cooperativas foram exitosas, outras não. Né? É, algumas foram exitosas até um certo momento e, ou, e outros momentos deixaram perder um pouco desse êxito. Né? So uh, on the settlements, that uh, some folks really wanted to join these cooperatives, others no. And that uh, as time goes on, um, people, some people chose to, to leave the cooperatives. É, até mesmo porque às vezes as pessoas é, ingressaram naquela cooperativa e posteriormente foram percebendo que não era a melhor forma de cooperação aquela, em termos de co cooperação coletiva, total coletiva, que é o caso da Copava. A Copava era, tudo era coletivo, né? até o comedor, o restaurante. Então, muitas pessoas foram percebendo que elas precisavam outra forma de cooperação, que não aquela coletiva, entendeu? É, então, o movimento também foi percebendo com o tempo que isso era 
é, possível e foi, foram flexibilizando essas, essas cooperativas coletivas para outras formas de cooperação mais abrangentes ainda, entendeu? So, um, so some folks, especially in the 90s, they entered into the, the new cooperatives. And José Luis draws from the Copab experience, which he knows well. And um, the Copab experience was, was extremely collective. Everything was collective. And so some people saw maybe that wasn't the best form of cooperation for them. And uh, so started searching for other kinds of cooperation as well. And so over the, the, the last years, even decades, there's been kind of a flexibilization of many different levels of cooperation. And I would just add a quick parenthesis that, uh, that uh, in the case of Copava, that's absolutely a big part that many people left the uh, larger cooperative and, and formed smaller um, market cooperatives, but they didn't stay so collective. Então, por exemplo, agora nós a questão do arroz agroecológico, por exemplo, nós temos cerca de quatro cooperativas que organizam o arroz conectados a uma cooperativa regional. Então, foi, é, nesse momento, é, é de alguma forma satisfatório porque teve uma amplitude muito grande, né? em torno dessa atividade do arroz. Então, é uma nova forma de cooperação, vamos dizer assim, é, que, que existe no atual momento. Então, alguns grupos coletivos, como a Copava, segue existindo, a Copava, a Copan, a Copate, é, é, mas ganhou força a outras formas de cooperação. So, in the case of agroecological rice, that in order to become the largest producers in Latin America, there's actually four cooperatives who come together around one regional cooperative. And, uh, and this is working. This is giving a satisfactory result. And uh, so that there's not one form of, cooper of cooperation. And in fact, the MST is very much always searching for and developing new forms of cooperation. And so Jose Lucia points out that some of those older cooperatives like Copava, Copan, that they, they still continue, but that, uh, that there are new, more flexible forms which are really sprouting uh, across the movement. Great. I would like to, well, we might have time for one very short question or maybe what, what would be maybe even better is if you all have any um, closing reflections. Eh, quería saber si, si tenían alguna reflexión que querían compartir eh, con nosotros previo a, a cerrar el evento. Eu gostaria rapidamente de, do tema da violência, que eu acho que é algo muito sério para todos nós, né? E... Eu, eu fiquei bastante sensibilizada com as informações de vocês, né? Acho que são culturas bem diferentes, obviamente, né? São realidades é, bem, bem diferentes. É, é claro que, para a gente, a violência do Estado e a violência paralela ao Estado aqui, ela é terrível, né? Ela é muito... Ela é aberta, ela é racista, ela é contra a mulher, né? Então mas vocês trazem dimensões de vocês, né? Então, é... isso toca a gente, né? sensibiliza a gente. E... e eu acho que a cada realidade, estratégias vão se... Né? Elas vão, vão surgindo, né? A, a história da luta como uma forma de viver, né? Como entender que não dá para parar nunca. Eu acho que é isso que eu vejo todos os dias nas mulheres, nas minhas vizinhas, né? Nas minhas amigas aqui do assentamento, né? é que elas entenderam isso. Então, a, 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 é uma vida em constante movimento, em constante luta, em constante busca por essa sociedade que não é a que a, a está que aí. Né? Então, tem hora que são movimentos mais subterrâneos, mais por debaixo da terra, que vão eclodir lá na frente, né? E tem hora que é uma luta aberta, que é uma luta de enfrentamento. Então, eu me solidarizo, solidarizo muito com, com os processos aí de vocês, né? E, e, enfim, que a gente possa continuar sonhando juntos e juntas. Sim, né? Então, 
she would like to really kind of finish with this very, very important theme of violence, which uh, is so serious for all of us, and how these different territories, these different cultures, that you know, that the violence perhaps is different, and in Brazil, that the state or forces parallel to the state, that it, you know, there are some really explicit, you know, and horrendous violence that 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 it continues, and so she's enjoyed learning a bit about in the U.S. and has become perhaps a little sensibilized, sensitized to um, maybe some of the forms that violence might happen in the U.S. And that every reality is going to have its own, its own workings. And she speaks about on the settlement, speaking with her neighbors, her, uh, her, uh, her female neighbors, that uh, you know, speaking about how, how this struggle is a way of life and, uh, and that it's ongoing. And, and, and that this is, this is the most important part. And that you know, sometimes the struggle is underground and is, you know, is, is way in the front. And then at other times the struggle you know, explodes into the open and, and that these are you know, very, very much interrelated. And so uh, she offers her solidarity with the problems in the US and, uh, and uh, has accompanied the, uh, the protests and the things happening in the US and offers her solidarity. Jose Luis, talvez você gostaria de compartilhar algumas palavras finais. Muito brevemente, é, foi, um, foi um prazer estar aqui nessa, nesse momento, né? É, esse evento que vocês estão promovendo, Andreas e, e Manuel, é um, acho que é muito importante para... Eu comentava antes, naquela conversação, né, antes de é, um espaço da gente é, trocar ideias essa é a palavra no português um espaço para trocar ideias so um, it's such a great pleasure to be in this space and uh, thanks everybody and uh, is really bringing out that idea and trying to reinforce that idea that how important it is to have these spaces to exchange ideas that exchanging ideas is, is a really, really critical part of the struggle. E nos animar um pouco, né? Eu fico contente porque é, na, na história da, do MST, o MST teve muitos aliados da sociedade brasileira, e esses aliados foram o que garantiram, digamos assim, a existência física, inclusive, do MST. E a existência, vamos dizer assim, ideológica do MST, né? nisso que eu falava de luta por transformação social, é, ela depende desses aliados. E um, né? e um dos aliados importantes do MST é a universidade. Porque a universidade é, é aquilo que eu falo anteriormente. Ela pode, se ela quiser, né? promover o máximo possível de aproximação com a sociedade, né? Ela tem esse papel aqui no Brasil, pelo menos, não sei como é um pouco nos Estados Unidos. Então, é, ela pode ser esse, esse espaço gerador. né Então, eu me alegro muito com essa com essa oportunidade. Andréas, digo, entretanto, que estamos aqui à disposição, para inclusive para trazer outras pessoas, não precisa ser necessariamente nós, outras pessoas, membra, membros é, do MST, né? em diversas temáticas, para a gente é, é, intercambiar é, ideias, porque né, a gente aprende e ensina ao mesmo tempo. Essa é, não queremos ensinar nada com vocês, mas também queremos aprender com vocês. Né? Acho que é isso aí. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, oh, yeah, and, uh, and, and again, this thing of exchanging ideas, that... Uh, but the history of the NST, that uh, allies, institutional allies, have not only been important, they've, they've guaranteed the physical existence of the NST. And uh, of course, beyond the, the physical existence of the NST, um, the ideological existence. And so again, um, that the university has been a really important ally for the movement. And that the, the university you know, has been able to promote bringing together society around these, these great issues. 
And so he really sees the university you know, needs to fulfill this promise. And he says, sometimes in Brazil, it's possible. He's not sure about the US of this uh, generative space. And uh, he very kindly ends that uh, again, offering is that uh, he and Diana are at, at, at their disposition disposition to uh, continue in, uh, in conversation, but also very much to bring other voices from the movement and to very much open you know, all different sorts of spaces, dialogue and, and exchange. So both with them and, and then uh, their, their compañeros. And uh, they really look forward that hopefully there'll be further spaces to exchange these ideas and you know, the importance that uh, learning and teaching happen at the same time. And that's the point of these exchanges. Muito obrigado, José. Caitlin, maybe uh, you'd like to go? Sure. Um, I think I'll kind of echo some of what has already been said. Um, so first, I, I really uh, express my thanks to uh, Manuel for coordinating this and for inviting me into this space and uh, to Andreas for the film. Um, I plan to, to use it in classes in the future with students. Um, and I, I just, you know, to Diana and Jose, it's been an honor to share this space with, with you. And I, I think what I'll close with saying is that I agree, um, I'd like to believe that in the US too, that the university can be a space for transformation. Um, I think this, this space here is on a small scale doing that. And I, I really love the idea of thinking about exchanges, but also exchanges where um, you know, people from Brazil, from the MST, from Mabi come to the US because I think that's often, it's one-sided. It's like people from the US go somewhere else. And I think that dynamic is problematic uh, when it's only that, it needs to be reciprocal. Um, and I think, you know, the final thing I'll say is what I hope is that as we think about transformation, we think about materially what that means for us because I don't know that, I don't think the university can be a site of transformation when it's too often tied up with maintaining, as I said earlier, the status quo. So how can we use it to create a space for collective uh, liberation and collective uh, collective learning? So thank you. Obrigada. Uh, Andreas, do you, do you... <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll wait. <laughs> Since I moved to Albuquerque in the late summer, even though it's snowing outside, I've had constant allergies. I just had a little attack there, my apologies. Um, you know, uh, I, I really appreciate how this, uh, on this unexpected turn really led by Jose Luis about talking uh, about the role of the university. And I really appreciate how Caitlin picked up on that. So I'm gonna kind of ride that bandwagon. That, uh, um, you know, Noam Chomsky has famously said recently that humanity is in the most dangerous time in all, in all of our history. And that if, uh, you know, I feel that if we're not courageous enough to step up in our academic positions and take some chances, then we're, I think we're really failing the possibility of the university. Now that said, that I had an offer out of graduate school 15 years ago to go to an R1 university, but I chose not to. And I went to an arts college where I could do the sorts of work and spend lots of time in Brazil and make films. And I'm really happy now to come to UNM, which I think has some really neat spaces as well. But I, I acknowledge that there's some real structural difficulties for um, academics within the R1 system to do that. But uh, um, you know, I, I think that everyone, I'm sure in this group who's in that position is pushing at the barriers. And I really feel inspired after having heard Jose, Luis and Diana looking at the power of allies to uh, do more work on my own and the UNM and beyond of doing these exchanges and, uh, and, and pushing the boundaries of the university. So thank you so much, everybody. And it's such a pleasure to share this film today. So thank you, you know, UNM, thank you, Pitt. And uh, thank you, Manuel, for translating, facilitating, and whatever else you're doing and juggling at the same time. And Caitlin for coming and sharing. And then, of course, uh, Jose Luis and Diana for sharing their immense international experience. But uh, I don't think it properly came out. Their work internationally has been really foundational in the, in the Via Campesino, in the extension of the MST, 
and the extension globally, in particular around Latin America, these ideas. So, you know, a real privilege to have, have your views today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm just glad to have been part of this, uh, of this event in, in, in whatever role. And we thank our audience. Uh, I would ask for the panelists to just give us a, a few more minutes after we, uh, everybody else leaves so that we can uh, do a brief debrief. Uh, and uh, and I, I wanna thank the audience for, for sticking with us and for the great questions and for uh, being here and perhaps even putting your energy towards thinking uh, these um, ideas that, that we think so highly of. So without further ado, I would like to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thank you. <laughs>